Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, the last uh, session uh, before the keynote. This is Alan May. I will be, uh, I am a volunteer in this OWASP community. I am moderating the session today. Uh, I am working today uh, with Synopsis, where I develop a partner set with a leading SI. Uh, Synopsis is a leading application security provider. So during the next 45 minutes, uh, you will be listening to uh, uh, Andreas uh, Falk. Oh, yeah, uh, who will yeah. talk about shift left security uh, with a security test pyramid. Please submit any questions you have uh, in the Q&A tab, which is uh, in on the Hoover platform, yeah? not here on, on the YouTube. Uh, I will leave uh, 45 minutes, as I said, to address the talk. And then uh, you will have, uh, we will have all together 10 minutes uh, for the Q&A and the wrap up and maybe a short word to introduce Andreas. He has over 20 years of experience in enterprise application development. He's working today as a management consultant for Novatech Consulting in Germany, and his focus is agile development and cloud and enterprise Java apps using the complete Spring platform. I hope it was a good introduction. Yeah. Uh, Andreas, you can <laughs> always uh, add a few more <laughs> details if you wish. And I hand over to you and I go in mute. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I share my screen. So welcome to my presentation on shift left security with the security test pyramid. Um, so I make it short. So I already introduced myself. So, so I'm from Germany. Uh, I just have to add that I'm also a member of the Open Web Application Security Project, so I always support that for several years now. Um, I'm also a member of the OpenID Foundation because I'm also doing lots of stuff for identity, access management. Um, yeah. So my company, that's the only slide of my company, just we are IT consultancy doing different things and we provide some consultancy special for security, like threat modeling, IoT security, or OpenID Connect. Um, and now let's dive into uh, our topic of the day, the testing pyramid. Um, I think most developers or builders in, in OWASP nomenclature uh, know the testing pyramid already. So the main idea of the testing pyramid is that it, it shows uh, what type of tests you should have in your projects and, and what amount of tests you should write. Um, what about the feedback of the tests? How big is the effort of tests to write? Um, so at the bottom, you see the unit tests. The unit tests uh, build the, the, uh, should be the, the most tests you build because this uh, serves as kind of a safety net for the developers. Um, so if you do refactorings, build new things, always run the unit test to see if you broke uh, anything with your new feature or refactoring. And these tests tend to run really fast. Uh, you get feedback in, in milliseconds. Um, on the next level, you have the service tests. Um, that's also sometimes are called integration tests in Spring, for example. Um, these are a bit harder to uh, write, um, uh, typically also using database, uh, some other third party uh, integrations maybe, and um, have much slower feedback already, because usually they start a container uh, doing things. And on the top level, you have the UI tests uh, that's uh, written, for example, using Selenium. And these tests are the slowest uh, tests with very really slow feedback. And these tests usually are hard to maintain. So if you have written Selenium tests so far, you know that these tests uh, tend to break very often. Um, and so that's why you should not have too many of these tests. Um, otherwise, it's hard uh, uh, because of that high effort to take. And there's some other alternative, which I like a bit more, uh, the testing pyramid by Gregory and Lisa Crispin. Um, so this is a bit more detailed one. So at the bottom still, you have the programmer tests, can be unit tests or component tests. 
And above that, you have the API service layer tests. Um, usually, this kind of tests already tests uh, more business rule uh, and function testing. Um, and on the top level, you have the workflow tests. So this uh, tests uh, don't need to be UI tests. So it can also be some kind of workflow test that have a bigger workflow implemented, just calling different REST API calls, for example. So, so it does not have to be Selenium tests. But still, it is a bigger workflow with some, some business-facing uh, thing to test and typically also runs a bit longer. And the top level, you have the manual testing and also explorative testing. But now, what about security? Um, so in all these testing pyramids, you never read about any security testing here. Um, so if the developer asks self, so, so what to do about security, then typically the number one thing the developer uh, sees is the OWASP top 10 lists. Um, the la latest one is for, from uh, last year um, with broken access control now number one. So, so before it, it has been injection at number one place that changed. Um, I show that over top 10 here, especially because I'm really glad that they also added a, a completely new uh, topic here to the list, uh, which is called insecure design. Um, and that is, is completely into the main focus that I currently talking about. So, so it deals about how to find uh, security requirements and how to, to make sure that that you test for all the security stuff. And um, so it starts with used threat modeling for all the critical parts of your application, then integrate, integrate the security language and all the controls into your user stories you are writing in your uh, sprints or Kanban uh, uh, yeah, processes. And then very important, write unit and integration tests to validate all the flows that you identified using threat modeling um, or in your user stories. And then also compile use cases or misuse cases. Uh, so, so don't only write uh, business facing user stories, but also try to write uh, misuse cases for each business use case from the view of a, a, an attacker. So, so what typically uh, does an attacker want to achieve with your business facing use case? So the, the most critical thing, uh, if you think about security testing is uh, you cannot really write good security tests if you don't have any clue about the security requirements. So the first thing to do is find concrete security requirements. Um, and in my experience, this is a really big, serious problem in typical projects because um, uh, very often managers go to their developers and tell the developers, so uh, the, the project you are building, uh, the, the application you are building should be secure. Sometimes they also tell, so it should be secure according to the OWASP top 10 lists. So, so they also see the OWASP top 10 list as some kind of uh, certification for the application, uh, which it is uh, typically not, um, just to, to have a checklist to check uh, for these kind of uh, requirements. But that does not help the developers pretty much. So, so, so um, uh, additionally, you won't tell the developers so that application has to be fast and has fast response times. So every developer then asks back, what does that mean? A fast response time, 10 milliseconds, one second, uh, two seconds. And for security requirements, requirements, you need that as well. You need concrete security requirements. And um, two helpful tools um, are here to, to help you to find concrete security requirements. The number one uh, thing is, also from the OWASP, the application security verification standard. So you get a PDF document with a whole catalog of typical security requirements. And you also can get an Excel sheet where you can then just check what is applicable for your projects. 
and then you have a complete list of typical uh, security requirements that you can directly put into your backlog, into your Jira issue tracker and, and something like that. And additionally, you also conduct threat modeling sessions uh, to identify flaws and, and really critical security points in your application, in your architecture. And with these two helpful things, you then identify all the security requirements. Um, to help for, for testing these uh, security requirements, to, to evolve tests out of these requirements, then there's another helpful guide called the Web Security Testing Guide by the OWASP that is also used by professional penetration testers uh, to conduct penetration tests. Um, this has, is full of ideas uh, how to build tests, how to, to, uh, to create tests, like for example, testing SQL injections and stuff like that. And then you can use the OWASP top 10 list just to make sure that you covered all the important aspects of, of uh, uh, the most critical security issues that can happen. Just to, to have some, some, uh, yeah, so some security check at the end if your security tests uh, cover all the important aspects. So for threat modeling, we can just talk about that uh, in one hour. Um, threat modeling is always asking for questions. So what are we working on? For that, you typically uh, draw a data flow diagram like the one you see on the slide for login service, for example. Here you have all the data flows with the protocols, uh, with the different components. You have a user that calls a login service via HTTP protocol. Uh, the login service uses a user database um, using GDPC as a protocol. And then you have different trust boundaries where you have changes uh, of, of user trusts. Um, like for example, login service might run in some cloud uh, provided service and the user database might work into some uh, data center you own. So there are different trust boundaries defined here. And then you just check what can go wrong in that picture. Uh, so, so one thing that could go wrong here is that you are using unsecured HTTP connection, for example. So somebody could just uh, grab uh, your password from the connection. Um, that could be one thing that could go wrong. And then you are thinking about what are we going to do about it? So in that case, just change to HTTPS connection. Um, and at the end, you always do some kind of retrospective. Did we do a good enough job? Um, and then um, if you have done all these things uh, regarding security requirements, then you can go further to, to find security tests that are fitting these requirements. And now we will dive into the different layers of the security testing pyramid uh, so that I can show you ideas uh, how to really start testing uh, security uh, already on the unit testing level. Um, here you clearly have uh, already um, tests like, like the static application security testing. Um, you also test for uh, dependencies so that your, your Spring Hibernate dependencies do not have any known vulnerabilities. Also, if you're using container images or Kubernetes, um, then you also conduct the container image scan at that stage. And then you typically add unit and component tests in an automatic uh, uh, execution fashion. Um, and here, typical tests you can already put as a unit test are uh, testing input validation. You can test for broken authentication stuff. You can also do the typical unit testing stuff like trying to bypass business logic that you have defined. Uh, write some negative tests that try to break your business logic to do uh, malicious stuff. Then also write tests uh, that uh, check errors uh, and blocking uh, messages. So if these messages are not uh, uh, yeah, returning sensitive data in the log messages or the errors uh, do not return complete stack traces, for example, uh, you can also easily test that uh, 
in your unit tests already. And also an important thing is to test for secure architecture. I will also show that uh, a bit later. So the number one thing that I see in most projects that is already um, been performed is the static application security testing. Here you have your source code. Um, then you run that source code uh, with some, some a tool that, that checks the source code against some rule set. And there are different tools available like SonarCube, SpotBugs, especially for Java. Uh, SEMGrep is, is some tool uh, that can uh, cover lots of different programming languages. Um, and at the end, you get a report uh, reporting uh, flaws and, and also security uh, issues in your source code. Um, the next uh, step would be that the dependency check or the software composition analysis, as is also called sometimes. Um, here you have uh, the software bill of materials as an input, the DES bomb. Um, then you run your, your SCA tool that then checks vulnerability databases uh, like the official ones by the NIST, um, and then also create some reports uh, on uh, vulnerabilities it, it found in your third party dependencies. And there are several good tools that have that already built in like NPM. You can just call NPM audit to see the issues. Uh, it is now also directly built in into IntelliJ in the latest version uh, with the packager plugin uh, that uses, for example, check marks behind the scenes to, to do that uh, for you. So you get automatic uh, information in your Gradle or Maven uh, build files for, for dependency uh, problems. And you can also use the OVAS dependency check. Um, then the next thing uh, I also want to stress a bit is testing secure architecture and design. Um, this is a very important thing and you can easily use uh, do that with using a tool called ArcUnit. Um, so typically this tool uh, is intended uh, to prove your architecture so that you don't have any violations in your architecture patterns. So for example, if you implement a layered architecture, then it just checks if uh, the calls uh, are according to the rules. So, so no calls from the, uh, uh, from, from the persistence layer to the UI layer, for example. Um, then you, but you can also test for other aspects like for security relevant aspects. You can check if your password policies are, are correctly implemented, uh, if you have uh, the input validation in place um, and also for broken authorization and also important for invalid calls to persistence APIs. So that is also quite helpful to avoid SQL injections. I will show that in a demo just in some minutes. Um, and then uh, one typical thing I also want to, to uh, to show in the demo is um, how to make sure, for example, uh, to, to, to have a password policy in place in your application. Um, so the application security verification standard also have, has clear uh, rules how to build a secure password security policy um, so that the user does not register itself uh, by using a, a password that only has five characters and only uses numbers, for example. As you can see in the picture, uh, such a password is quite insecure and it's uh, cracked instantly. Um, in Java, for example, you could use a framework for that called PASAI, uh, which I have in the demos um, that can create uh, password policies that can then also be checked using uh, bean validation, for example. So it's time for some demo. Um, here is also the link for the corresponding GitHub repository I have uh, provided with all the demos. I will only show a part of that of the demos available here for time reasons. Um, just go there and also try to, to look yourself and, and uh, try to execute some of the demos. Um, what I built here is actually a sample application that administers bookmarks uh, similar to the web browsers uh, 
are doing that. Um, you have an API for administrating users, and you also have an API to administer bookmarks, just a, a standard REST API that I provided here as a demo application. And to start things up, I already have run uh, some uh, code analysis uh, over my demo application. Um, and as you can see, it identified uh, some security hotspots with Sonar Cube, so it failed already with the quality gate here. Um, I, I built uh, lots of security problems into the application by intention. Um, so in that case, it identified some of these uh, built-in uh, issues already. So I built in some SQL injection uh, problems in the application that have been identified by SonarCube in the static analysis already. I also used, uh, I disabled the CSRF protection in Spring Security that is also reported here. Um, I have also some others. So I also use some weak hashing algorithm as well. So these are the kind of things that are identified already on, in, at that stage. Um, then I also have uh, spot bugs. So you get similar uh, reportings here. Also the MD5, also some SQL injection problems. So quite similar. Um, and I also, uh, can show how SEMPREP reports that. So, so here you can see a sample of SEMPREP that I have run uh, just before the start of the session. Um, here you see uh, also other stuff. So, so it does not only check the Java source code. In that case, it has lots of rules for, for other types of uh, uh, um, files, for example, it also checks YAML files, bash files, type files here that are included. Like, for example, it checks uh, for, for API keys and passwords that are hard coded here. Um, but it also checks for, for, for privileged uh, uh, containers um, that are not uh, used correctly, like using the root user, for example. And it also checks for uh, let me show also again for the MD5 problem here, and it also reports the CSRF uh, problem down here somewhere, and also the uh, the SQL injection problem. So so these tools report similar things. Um, so I would advise that that you at least use one of these tools in your project. And maybe from time to time, just recheck with some uh, additional tool just to make sure that that uh, this other tool may find uh, also different things. Um, then the next thing I want to show in the demo um, are the architectural tests that you can use for the security facing uh, testing. And here you see a typical um, architecture tests with ArcUnit. Um, this is a predefined rule. Um, so here, for example, I want to test if uh, my application fulfills all the uh, rules uh, that are used for a layered architecture. So in the layered architecture, you typically have a presentation layer where you have the REST API. Then you have a business logic layer uh, here called services because I use Spring uh, services. And then you have a data access layer here called the persistence layer. Um, and then you define uh, the packages where these layers are located. And then you can just uh, add checks. Um, so that's, for example, the controllers layer. So the presentation layer uh, uh, is not allowed to be accessed directly by any other layer, but the, the REST API layer can access the service layer and the service layer can access the persistence layer, but not the other way uh, around. So this is made sure by, by these tests, uh, which is can try to run that test. So as it is a, a unit test that sh should run quite fast. So, so we can see that the test is, is, uh, is green. So, so all the dependencies are respected in that case. But now you can also 
try these things for, for using it for uh, security related stuff. Um, like for example, for uh, checking um, if you implemented the authorization on, uh, for example, the authorization on the, the method layer in Spring. So I use Spring Boot all, all over the way here in my project. Um, and in Spring, uh, you typically have a, a annotation for that called the pre-authorized annotation that you just put on every operation um, and then here declare uh, what the authorization should look like. If it's a role-based authorization or some dynamic uh, facing uh, authorization, um, you can do both with that uh, pre-authorized annotation. And here in that case, you just check any methods that are public that are reside in that package, in the service package, um, because we are on the method level uh, to check the authorization. A different thing would be the, the web uh, UI, the REST API level. That would be checked later in the integration tests. Um, and they have simple names that end with service at the end. Um, and are declared in, in classes that are annotated with the service annotation uh, of Spring. And then uh, each and every uh, method should be annotated with the pre-authorized annotation. Or the whole class should be uh, annotated with that thing. And we can also check if that is uh, fulfilled uh, by our application. Um, and in that case, the test fails um, because let me just down a bit. Um, so so we, we don't have any authorization checks at all in place because I built that in an insecure way. So it clearly identifies that we really need uh, some kind of authorization checks for all these operations. And you can easily just have that in the unit test la layer already. Uh, a different demo uh, that I can show is um, that you can easily test if the developers are using invalid uh, calls for, for, uh, for data access. So in, in that case, uh, it is a Spring Boot application that also uses a Spring Data JPA. So it uses JPA, the Java Persistence API for accessing uh, data. Um, and in that case, uh, it is not allowed to directly use the Java SQL uh, packages. Um, it, is, it is also not allowed to, to use the, the org hibernate um, um, packages directly and also not the Java X persistence uh, directly. Um, um, because uh, we use uh, Spring Data and it can only use uh, packages of org Spring framework data. In that case, I have implemented two rules. Uh, so the first rule is that uh, the service layer should not call any data access layer at all. So it's not intended to call the data access layer directly from service classes. So it's only intended uh, to, to have the data access layer clearly at the data package. Um, so that's why also here that that package is not allowed. And here from the data access layer, only these packages are allowed. So let me also try to run that test here. So, so it also um, violates uh, both of these tests. Um, so you can see um, that's the, the bookmark service uh, I have implemented here a bookmark search uh, method that directly has a call to Java X persistence entity manager, um, which tends to be some really uh, strange thing. Um, so if I just open up that source code, uh, then you see that we use the entity manager here directly, which is an anti pattern when you're using a uh, spring data JPA. So you should never have to directly call the entity manager. And here you find the really uh, nasty uh, source code by directly using low level JDBC API. 
and then just concatenating the input directly with the SQL statement, which is a, a, a good reason to have a SQL injection. And you clearly can find that already on unit test level uh, with the ARC unit tests. Uh, on unit test level, you can also have uh, tests for, for password security requirements tests, like here, for example. And um, here I also uh, just have taken uh, chapters from the ASVS document of the OVAS with the security requirements and then also implement the test for each and every subsection of that uh, paragraph. Um, like for example, that passwords are at least 12 characters in length. Um, and also uh, that, that you can also use passwords that are 64 characters or even longer. Um, what else do we have? So also a typical thing that uh, no password truncation is performed behind the scenes, which is also quite bad for the user experience. Um, let me check if we have some results here. So as you can see, uh, it, it, it violates uh, something, so it is not checked uh, that, that uh, passwords are at least 12 characters in length. So, so we have uh, no, no uh, violation that was expected here. So we expected one uh, violation of the bean validation constraints, but we have zero. So that's an error here. Um, and we can test that for different kinds of uh, password policy uh, aspects. So you can basically implement most of the subsections of that ASV uh, section here. So some sections are uh, difficult to, to, uh, to test. Um, like for example here, where if our users can change their password. So usually you can only test that in the integration test uh, by just calling uh, so some method that changes the password and then checks for, for authorization uh, here. So these have been the uh, typical things you can do on the unit testing level. Um, on the security, a service testing level, um, you can test for uh, for additional things like like uh, input validation again. Uh, but here uh, you can also already test that on the REST API level, for example. Then you can also test authentication parts, um, authorization parts on the REST API on the web layer as well. You can also test for session management. Um, especially if you have implemented the session management by yourself, which I would not recommend. Um, I always recommend uh, using a session management provided by your framework like Spring Security or from the application server side. Uh, yeah, for example, if you use WebLogic still or, or, or uh, from JBoss Wildfly, uh, then use the session management provided uh, from that uh, framework. You can also test for file uploads, uh, test that only uh, defined types of files are uh, accepted when uploading. <clears throat> and, and with that, I mean, that's not only you check the extension of a file, but you also check, for example, the, the magic bytes um, so that um, a user cannot upload an executable file, for example, instead of a PDF. Um, you can then also add tests for, for injections and also test for security misconfiguration, like uh, the typical misconfiguration that you might have for, for cross-origin resource uh, um, security um, that you configure uh, for your browser um, uh, security uh, um, uh, precautions. Um, you can also make big mistakes by putting, for example, wildcards uh, in your origin here. Um, so one thing I also want to stress here is, is that the general access control design is an example from the ASVS, um, which I can also show in the demo shortly. So then let's jump directly to the demo again. Um, 
So we had uh, the unit testing and the architecture level. Um, if we look at the integration testing level, I just want to show uh, how to test for SQL injections as an example here. Um, so for testing SQL injections, you can just start with uh, some easy payload that you find everywhere. If you just have a simple Google search for, for testing SQL injections, you typically will find a payload just like that one. So with that payload, you just add that payload to your where statement at the end of the SQL statement. And with that, you can easily check uh, your own uh, service calls or data access calls if you have some problems regarding SQL injections. Uh, with that payload, I just called my uh, search bookmarks method where I built in uh, such a problem by intention. I just put in that SQL injection payload. And usually if you do not have any SQL injection problem, you would expect uh, that you get an empty result uh, when testing the search uh, operation by putting that payload inside because I did not have defined any bookmark uh, that would match that uh, search criteria. But let's see what this test will tell us. So this is an integration test. So, so you will recognize that it runs a bit slower, but I just have run that before sometimes. So that's why it, it, now it runs really faster. Um, and as you can see here, we did not get back an empty list, but instead, uh, so it was expecting empty, but instead, because it, we, we have a sequence injection problem here, we just Return, have been returned the complete contents of the table that is built in an H2 in-memory database in that case. So this is a clear sign that we have a SQL injection problem here. And you can easily just add tests to test uh, that uh, for all your uh, uh, service calls in that case. Uh, so I have also put in some other security problems as well in different locations here. Um, this is just one example uh, that you can test. So th this was about uh, the service layer. And on the top layer, you can then have your dynamic application security testing stuff. Um, like for example, uh, the, the OVASEP tool, there's also commercial uh, uh, variant of that by Stackhawk. Um, then you have the Portswick Burp Suite, uh, that is the commercial uh, thing compared to the OVASEP tool. Then you have also specialized tool, you can just use the SQL map tool for finding SQL injections, the NMAP tool to, to find uh, open ports uh, on your environments, and, and yeah, check what services are running there. But you can as well use uh, just standard tools like, like the Gatling tool that is usually used for performing uh, stress testing, uh, yes, some load testing stuff. And with that, you can also easily just uh, test locally already if your application has problems uh, according to, to denial of service attacks. So, so just... Uh, put in some, some stress testing with the Gatling tool, put lots of loads on your REST API and see um, if you can improve things uh, regarding denial of service attacks. Like for example, adding an API gateway with some, some uh, resilience uh, patterns like rate limiting stuff, for example. Um, regarding the, the test tools, so, so these typically run uh, in that way that you have a running client, uh, like a single page application, then you have a running server with a Spring Boot backend, for example, and then you put uh, that uh, test tool just uh, in the middle of these two sites as some kind of proxy. Um, and this proxy then uh, gets all the requests and responses uh, from the client to the server and the responses back from the server. 
it can record all the uh, request responses and then you can run a scanner automated scanner uh, with some predefined rule sets um, that can conduct passive or active scanning uh, passive scanning is just uh, uh, checks that are um, conducted when executing the request and responses by just looking at request responses for some unusual patterns and the active scanner just tries uh, to attack the application using the well-known URLs you have identified and just trying to put sequence action attacks, uh, cross-site scripting attacks, and all the stuff that you know about from the OWASP step 10. Um, for the OWASP tool, this is quite convenient to also include that in your CI-CD pipeline with the container that are provided. Um, here you have a baseline scan just doing passive scanning. Uh, the most important one for my REST API would be the API scan. Uh, here you can just put uh, open API definition uh, to OWASP with all the URLs that you have defined. Um, and with that, you can easily just test against that uh, defined APIs. And you can also conduct a full scan, but a full scan I would advise not to put in your regular CI CD pipeline because a full scan might run for hours depending on your size of the application. So just put that one in some nightly scan and put the baseline scan or API scan as part of your usual CI CD pipeline. We can also show you some only short demo here. I've set up the application already so so the application is running here as you can see um no, this is the wrong one this is the application so i cleared the locks already um and i can now uh, start uh the sap api scan i have also a, a script already in inside the projects so i just start that because it, it takes some time to to, to show the results um, I already have run that before. Um, you can see the results that OWASP has found uh, in an automatic fashion. Um, so it detected some server errors that it, it detected with uh, 500 HTTP status. Um, uh, the really critical ones are again sequence actions. It detected uh, some application error disclosure with some some stack trace it detected. Um, also some cross-site scripting uh, with persistent cross-site scripting maybe and also reflected cross-site scripting as well. So whereas cross-site scripting, you would not uh, uh, yeah, fix that uh, basic primarily on the backend. You would fix that in your single page application um, by using some uh, good framework like Angular that has uh, context aware uh, encoding uh, on already in place and also sanitization in place. Uh, it is really difficult to solve cross-site scripting on the back end. The only thing you can do here is also put uh, input validation. So the last thing I would just to show is, because uh, the time is already quite up, um, is that all the things I have shown to you so far, uh, you should automate completely. So automate the static code analysis, automate the dependency check as part of your CI CD pipeline. Um, and then also um, do a container image scan uh, with Privy, for example, as an open source tool, uh, if you're using containers and also Kubernetes, stuff like that. Um, then you put the, the, the image into the registry, then you deploy that to a Kubernetes cluster, and then you have the running application and then you can uh, conduct dynamic security scan using OWASP, for example, as shown. Um, and on the top, you have the manual uh, testing. Here you can also conduct security-related manual testing, like uh, explorative security tests. You can, uh, you should do security code reviews. So this is a really critical point. Uh, you always should have security code reviews in place um, as part of your project. So, so in our projects, no 
code will be pushed to the master branch in our Git uh, version control without any security code review. So, so, uh, so it always requires at least one uh, human person to conduct a security code review. And then clearly you also have the pen tests. So with explorative security tests, you just try to, to uh, test some special functionality, like for example, you want to test some uh, special business functionality in your application uh, for injection attacks. Um, with, for that, there's also a quite useful tool called Bug Magnet, which you can uh, install in your Chrome browser, for example. Um, and then you have a, a context-aware uh, menu available on each and every input field. Uh, where you can just try out different payloads and try to find uh, nasty things. Then one anti-pattern I still find in lots of projects, uh, unfortunately, is uh, that lots of projects only rely on penetration testing um, and don't conduct any uh, uh, continuously uh, performed security tests at all. So they... Uh, follow the DevOps approach already. They do continuous delivery, deploy uh, several times a day, for example, um, but only do penetration tests maybe uh, two times a year. So that's a typical pattern I often see at companies. And on the top, you see the work that an attacker is doing. So attacker typically work 24 seven. Uh, they don't know holidays. They don't know nothing uh, about uh, project vacations and stuff like that, or weekends. Uh, so they try to hammer on your application all the time. And if you only have penetration tests like two times a year, all the deployments uh, that are running after such penetration tests um, will be a blind spot completely. So, so you can never be sure uh, if you are safe from attacking. So that's why continuously testing for yourself is so important. As a summary, um, you should put security testing on each and every layer of your security testing pyramid, um, as shown in demos and also on the slides. And a second summary is that uh, it is not sufficient to only have tooling in place and in contact automated testing, but it is really important uh, to understand each other very good. So, so, so developers should also show empathy for operations and also for security and vice versa. Um, so our main idea, for example, would be that a developer just tries to, to work one day uh, at the security uh, role. Uh, the security person works for one day as a developer and, and also operations. With that way, you can much more improve uh, the understanding for the other side, what, which are typical problems you have to care about. Um, and this is a really critical point to understand each other. So, so DevOps is basically a thing of uh, cultural things and not just putting tools everywhere. So this is an important thing here. Uh, so that's all I want to tell. So I'm open for questions now. I just put in the, the URL of all the demos on the bottom, so you can note that down. Uh, you can scan my code for any contact details if you want to contact me. So feel free to ask your questions. Thanks a lot. This was very clear. Uh, I have looked. Can you also look? I did not see any questions. Uh, it refreshed it. I hope I have the right link. So it was so clear that nobody has questions. So that <laughs> so it was very clear, I guess. I have a question for you. Just a moment. I'm rechecking on the uh, on the Hoover uh, platform. Yeah, we still have ten minutes left. Yeah, we have. Uh, okay, I come back here to the, the Zoom. Yeah, we have an audience of uh, twenty nine attendees plus you and me. That's thirty one. So um, I repeat for the benefit of the audience, please do not hesitate to uh, raise a question in the Q&A, not here uh, on Zoom or YouTube, but on the Hoover platform. We still have another five to 10 minutes. Uh, in fact, I will uh, raise a short question. I liked mm -hmm. uh, the, the last uh, 
slide where you talked about communication and you, uh, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned something which I, I have never heard before in 20 years of, uh, of development and security, whereby you said that the developers should spend uh, maybe a day, a year or so uh, with the security folks and basically the security folks operations yeah. and vice versa, right? So this yes. is basically uh, what I call the, a, cultural, a cultural change, yeah? Yeah. Uh, so that people understand uh, that uh, all the three, let's say, um, functions have different goals and challenges, yeah? Now, since yeah. you work as a consultant, uh, do people start to implement such a best practice and such a good advice that you listed? Do, do they start to do that? Is this a big company, uh, let's say, uh, attitude or rather a small company? Yeah, it, it, it better works at smaller companies, I have to admit. So, so in bigger companies, you have much uh, more problems because these companies tend to fulfill all the compliance issues mm. all the time. So in that mm. company, so in my, yeah, in that companies, you, you only do uh, security by bureaucracy. So as I tell sometimes, <laughs> so these people are interested just to, to, to check marks so they can report to their management. Oh, we have mm. done our things here. So we have made sure that we looked at each and every component here, but that does not improve anything on security. Mm. From my mm. mind so, so it's much mm. better to really exchange a role sometimes because i always uh, hear developers are oh, that security folks they don't want us to deploy anything to production so they always say no to our new features and then vice versa so, so security people oh the developers don't have any clue about security they always build yeah. insecure things and and we should teach them all the time so to not do that and, and they don't understand our penetration testing reports at all and these are the misunderstandings and you can mm. clearly understand much better if you just take over the role for one day and and see that also the security people have their own problems to to deal with so mm. uh, but have you seen companies uh experience this, uh, I don't know how you call that, uh, rolling uh, job whereby uh, they, they switch uh, so that they understand. Because today I know that, uh, that there is this frustration that you just mentioned. Yeah, if sometimes even the hate. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> but the, the developers see the other ones are delaying, yeah? Uh, the, um, the sprints and, and the timelines. The operations people, of course, see the risk of having uh, uh, regular uh, uh, updates. And the Suriki folks are a bit in between, right? The code between yeah. operations. And basically, you know, we moved from development to, to DevOps. And now the, it's DevSecOps, yeah? yeah. But uh, I mean, do companies, I mean, is it, you know, does it need the sponsorship of a CISO or a CIO to get this, uh, uh, I don't know how you call that, uh, rolling, rolling job, uh, cultural, uh, uh, updates happen. I mean, I have never heard about that. And actually, this is very interesting that you mentioned this. I, yeah, mean, I, I only tried it out so far in a smaller company. In my yeah. current project in big companies, it's it's almost impossible to do that. So, so uh, you have so so many standards in, yeah, and the silos, right? guys are so far away from our developers. Yeah. So they are they are sit in their own apartment and they, yeah. they are not integrated somehow in our project. So that's the main issue we have. So so hmm. they, they always tell us, oh, not to do that one, not to do this one. And yeah, yeah. that's the biggest issue we have there. Hmm. No, that's a very good point. Okay, I'm still looking. Uh, we still have uh, five, six minutes left. Uh, just for the benefit of your audience. Uh, this was the last uh, session. Yeah, we have five sessions in parallel, and um, we will soon have uh, the final session, which is a keynote. Fifteen years of OWASP top ten as the cloud made a difference, which of course is a very interesting topic for all of us. Let me quickly check if some more questions have come up. I refresh. Yeah, I, I just wanted to mention as well. So, so I don't like the term DevSecOps pretty much. Ah. Because I, I see security is always have to be in DevOps already. So so for me, yeah. that's the security thing should be a silent thing. So you should not have to stress DevSecOps. So, so, so. 
yeah, so that uh, security is built in uh, yes. in the development uh, cycle tools uh, culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good two point two point point. I'm because sure you will I make always that. have problems to to put uh, it to sec DevOps to DevSecOps or DevOps sec. So so that's <laughs> the number one problems I already have. So so so. <laughs> And also, yeah, I mean, sure. shift left. There's also some bit, some confusion sometimes. So by shift left, I don't mean basically you just have to shift left everything, but you should rather put security in all your project phases. So, so put it yeah yeah anywhere at, at, synop there. yeah at synopsis we say shift everywhere because security yeah. should be you know from the beginning to the end yeah uh, exactly and it's it's more a, a cultural habit than a, yeah than just a process yeah. Uh, yeah. And also don't forget your applications that are not uh, in active development anymore. So that's also a problem lots of companies forget about. So that even ah, yeah. those applications need some security fixes from time to time. Yeah, you're talking about then uh, like more uh, legacy applications. Yes, exactly. Or, or applications that are subject to, uh, yeah, to less uh, updates. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, any maybe final um, advice or tips from your uh, excellent presentation? Let's just start with some some easy tests, like like putting tests for sequence action mm -hmm. or at least for for the authorization. So as we have seen, broken authorization is the number one uh, issue on the OWASP top ten list. So so you clearly mm -hmm. should put lots of effort, make sure that you don't have any holes in your uh, authorization matrix. Hmm. Okay. And with Spring Security and frameworks like that, they have so so uh, excellent testing support built in already. So so you can easily write that kind of automated tests. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Andreas, uh, and thanks yeah. a lot to the audience for making it uh, on the Thursday afternoon. Here it's close to five p.m.